I saw that the musical content of engineering was the marriage that needed to be made. It was the first time I ever made a record as a soloist. Um, it was at RCA, and I'll never forget it. You know, the microphone was put in a place, and I started to edge forward, and he said, the engineer said, don't do that. You see that white line I just put on the floor? Don't move. Just play. And I realized how tough and strict it was in order for you to make the mono tape or the stereo tape, and especially when they were experimenting with stereo, almost every studio was. Fred Plout was a big influence on me. Back in the late 50s and 60s, I, I would go down to see him do 30th Street. And Fred would look at the score and would talk to the French horns or trombones. He said, letter F, the upbeat is too loud. You will make sure it's mezzo forte, not forte. He was dictating the audio. And if they didn't respect him, I don't think it would have happened. But the conductors were in full agreement because remixing wasn't a part of our life. My life was totally involved in how we could get to a multi-track, like a three-track would have been a gift. Coming from two, it really was a gift. And when I started A&R recording in the early, well, late 1958, 59, by the time 1960 rolled around, we had a three-track. We were of the independent studios some of the youngest guys doing that. But there was a Bill Schwartow, and there was uh, Tom Dowd, who already had the 8-track. I never got over how envious I was that Les Paul and, and Atlantic Records had an 8-track. But I had friends like Bob Fine, and if I, you think I was fussy, let me introduce you to Bob Fine. All of those guys demanded and constructed their own variables on the, on the, the plate, the machines. The thing that changed a and R was that Harvey Jr. said to me, look, I'm not selling these big EMT plates. Could we do something? And I said, well, why don't we use my place as a showroom? You just place it there, and Schwarta and I will see why it's not appealing to the community that wants space. They want rooms, real rooms, Bell Sound, all of the other studios. Regent sort of had a, 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 a form of spring and delays and stuff. And NOLA. I mean, the competitors at the time in the indie world were quite heavy. And sort of my role model was what Fred Plout did down at 30th Street. Because I would listen to Streisand and you could go to the exaggerated Mitch Miller records or and I loved Capitol's sound out of, you know, radio recorders and obviously out of the, the, the round building on Sunset and Vine. I had this one EMT and it sat right in the, on, the, on the fourth floor, right in the control, uh, right in the studio. Unless you banged into it with a chair, it's the same content, it wasn't, it wasn't a terrible thing to hear. And I'd set it so I learned a lot about EMTs ended up with four of them in that place, and eventually four for every studio we ever owned. Suspended them in, as you may remember, in basements, on chains. But the idea was not to have people mess around with the delay. I don't mean the delay, the delays were variable anyhow. And I stole that from Fred Plout, watching him take a tape machine and delay it in and delay it out and create those incredible sounds that became Columbia Records in my book. I mean, everybody, the great ones, sort of copied it. And when you got it subtle, which is what I think A&R developed, was my desire that a vocal sound would have its own chamber and no brass or guitar would ever be fed into it, which is, you know, unique at the time. It's funny now that we can have all of this digital and all of combinations of sounds and samples of you know, lexicon, we let them study David Smith, gave them all of the chambers at A&R. And those things still exist somewhere. Yeah. The, uh, the point is that once it became easy, I have a son who's an engineer, and, and I looked at him one day and I said, 
if you only had to paint the walls as much as we did and have to keep moving the speaker and then when it got wet from the mold and how to how to make sure the microphone which a capital down below the surface is actually not even a condenser mic which is fine but all of that art to be transferred into a digital domain and I see guys mixing they'll mix with seven or eight chambers but intermix all of the music which is okay if you're trying to make a live stage version but if you want the the purity and the instrument instrument to have life and you've got all of this luxury of just wonderful ways to stretch and say how long the delay and how long is the, the size and how big is the room that you're imitating. Um, I think that in itself was the master beginning for studios because studios supposedly had a sound. Every kid that came along started the same way. You put them at least two weeks to four weeks, depending, in the library so they could understand the value of the tape, what, the, what a take sheet meant, what it meant to go looking for a box that was ill, not made uh, comfortable to read, handwriting, what, what you did with it, information, being able to tell the engineer, I found the tape, it was 1218, 1963, um, it says, and it's leadered, tapes were leadered, um, and your take sheet was in triplicate. Well, that's okay. That's just the beginning. Then, if you think that's good, now let's learn the part two, how to cut the disc. We were one of the early independents that had a Neumann lathe, more automated than most. But most important was, yes, it had a preview head, and yes, you could monitor, and yes, you could do things. But if you couldn't cut a good disc, and you couldn't understand sibilance, and DSs were not key on the market, they would pretty much take the S and every end of the top end out in a, in a multi-track mix, that was avoidable. Not that the Orban was one of the earliest ones I remember, and it was not the best thing ever made, but it, you could DS slightly and then with some careful limiting and taking a fair child, and I mean, there were so many techniques that we had to develop. But if you developed something on a date, all eight or ten other trainees coming up the line had to know it right away. We shared the information. You shared how, I mean, the way Elliot and other people got broken in was kind of the way Schwartow threw a date at me one day. I was just helping him and assisting him. And he said, I don't feel good. Finish the date. And he left. And that's how you learn. That's when you, you take over the airplane. John Barry, who was doing a movie called Midnight Cowboy, which we did at 7th Avenue. And um, after the score was being, he just looked at me and he said, why don't you produce some of the other tracks in this movie? I said, me, alone? He said, yeah, I'll approve them. I'll tell you if I like them or not, but you're free to go do this. And it stepped a huge hit into my hands. Everybody's Talking became a huge number one song. Uh, Harry Nielsen, and Toots Thielman's main title that John had written. John Barry was probably, uh, along with Burt Backrack and Hal David, were the people who elevated my role, even to put my name on a record as an engineer, was unusual. As you know, corporate America never put the engineer's name <laughs> anywhere. He might ask for a raise. You can't make just a record anymore. <laughs> You can. You can drive your car with the record, but the visual could be there. Should not be avoided. And we are, I mean, I walk into studios, I say, when are you going to hang a grid, a piece of pipe, just pipe, so the lighting guy can walk in? We did it at Capitol when we did Tony Bennett. They were very nice to us. And we automated the first three cameras with a guy sitting in another control room so that Tony did not have to look at a cameraman in his face. And then when we get a take, we allowed the cameraman to go up for close-ups. And they did a take, but of course I recorded that take. That was my editing take, that was my extra take, and sometimes it was the master. Once everybody knew that they were comfortable, 
that's the, that's where for me I still have for me what I think are the audio visual chops that an engineer needs to have <laughs>